The following is a presentation of the ILR School at Cornell University. ILR, advancing the world of work. Good afternoon. Welcome to this live webcast with Professor James Gross. Professor Gross is celebrating his 50th academic year at at Cornell at ILR. He came here in the summer of 1966 from Holy Cross College and he is known to legions of students, myself included, um, for his teaching on workers' rights, his human rights, labor law, arbitration, etc. He's influenced literally thousands of students and today he's going to talk to us a little bit about his journey here to Cornell and the legacy that he's imparted onto students. So Jim, could you get us started and tell us a little bit about what led you to Cornell? Um, <clears throat> first of all, I want to thank uh, Deep Felt. Thanks for those who signed up for this conversation. I'll try to make it as much a conversation as possible and not uh, wind baggage so that uh, there are no time for questions. So I'm going to do my best with that. I do want to warn, however, people who uh, are my former students. I will not change any grades whether you <laughs> signed up or not. So we get that straight <laughs> right at the outset. How did I get to Cornell? I ask myself that question regularly. Uh, and when I thought about, Mary said she was going to ask me that, and uh, when I thought about how to respond to that, I was reminded of an event in a local supermarket pushing my little basket around. And coming around the aisle in the direction, in my direction, uh, was a student that I had in class that particular time. And as he approached me, I could see sort of blinking. And then as we got very close, he said in a kind of a quizzical way, Professor Gross? And I said, yeah, you know, Fred or whatever, how are you doing? Uh, what are you doing here? He says to me, and I said, buying food. Uh, and then he a little pause and he stopped and he said, I never thought of you that way. And that's, I guess, my dual theme for answering that question, how I got to Cornell. Uh, it's, what am I doing at Cornell? I don't mean, what do I do at Cornell? I mean, what am I doing at Cornell? And then the second question is more of, Really to understand that and understand that I am at least <laughs> uh, usually a human being. And so that it's not that I just appear for class and office hours and then disappear. He said, you know, I never thought of you that way. Uh, what happens? Do I have a life outside? And I think that life outside really explains a lot about how I got to Cornell, but more so about my perception of being a professor at Cornell, sort of self-perception. And I, I would like to be able to convey that uh, uh, to the folks who have signed up for this. Um, I'm going to start off by saying I was born, and so don't groan and say, oh my God, how many years you know, has he been around? He's going to go, you're, no, no, no. But I was born in Philadelphia, southwest Philadelphia. Uh, Spent most of my life moving one side to the other, the Delaware River, Jersey side, uh, uh, Philadelphia side. Um, was raised by what I call a committee of women. My father played, were, and parents were divorced when I was a uh, year and a half, and my brother was born. Uh, the, uh, my father brought me to his sister's. And a wonderful woman, always referred to as Aunt Katie, who was a teenager, came over as a teenager from Ireland, had gone to four grades of school, uh, and s never married, but spent her life uh, working and raising and educating uh, a whole pile of kids who were not her own, uh, including uh, me. The, uh, that, Household was uh, one of people who were frustrated, angry, um, disappointed, disillusioned, uh, poor. Uh, a good chunk of our early lives or my early life was 
realizing what people were trying to do is, as my Aunt Katie would put it, try to stay off relief. That is, I mean, today we call welfare. Stay off relief because it was a more a pride thing. But uh, my father was a wonderful man, very talented man, uh, very frustrated man, died at 46 as a complete total alcoholic. Um, sad, sad story. But I, with all of those negative att attributes, there was an enormous amount of love in that house. Uh, I, was, I show a film to the students uh, in recent years, in, in, an interview with Maya Angelou by, uh, with Bill Moyers. And she's returning to her home in Arkansas, Stamps, Arkansas, where she grew up. And, was, and she kind of muses to herself as she's approaching the town. She said, you know, I was vastly hurt in this town and vastly loved. When she said that, it just kind of clicked with me. Yeah, it, it wasn't all bad, it wasn't all good, but it was sort of a human struggle um, to get along and, and survive. And so there was a lot of hurt, but also a lot of love. But it, what it meant for me, kind of connecting, how do I get into academics in part, was I want to escape a lot. And there were two major escape routes for me, one being baseball and the other being school. Uh, when I say escape, I mean literally get out of the house uh, and uh, be somewhere where you're doing something that you're pretty good at and getting congratulated about it, being in school. Now, I went to a uh, Catholic grammar school with Dominican nuns. And all of the hor horrible things that Catholic priests have done to boys and, and others in, uh, uh, I did not experience. I had the good fortune of experiencing truly uh, the love of these, of these women. And so uh, in reflection, I don't know, I would not be sitting here having this conversation that we're going to have and we're all going to have. Uh, if it had not been for that committee of women who raised me uh, and for those Dominican nuns. But in our household, college was not an option. It wasn't thinking about going to school. For my Aunt Katie, her aspirations for me were to get an office job where I could wear a shirt and a tie, where I wouldn't have to have, you know, go in the mines or in the factory or whatever. That was the aspiration to get, not to get to Yale or Harvard or whatever, but to get an office job, graduate from high school and, uh, and get an office job. The, and that was fine with me. But the, base, the connection between baseball and education came when in order, I just cut this short, but in order to uh, continue what I thought was going to be a professional baseball career, I had to go to college because um, I couldn't sign a contract. I was too young at the time. Anyway, and where did I go to college? Not the college I had studied and I wanted to go to this because my career aspirations or whatever. I went to LaSalle College because the coach of the, of the baseball team at LaSalle was a former Philadelphia Phillies pitcher. And so that's why I went to LaSalle. Turned out to be one of the great, accidentally, one of the great experiences of my life. The, the people, the faculty members at that college were in, now university, but college then, were just enormously supportive and helpful to me. Uh, it was a, a kind of escape <laughs> still, uh, but it was a, a marvelous one. I was a first generation college thing. Um, uh, just as an aside footnote, anybody's interested, we're doing the Cleet Daniel, have my dear friend, uh, a, uh, and started the internship program. We're funding interns, not exclusively, but mainly who are first generation college students who would like to go on an intern, but it would be an unpaid internship and uh, can't afford it, so we're establishing some fund to help out with that. But that, that in part, is the idea. Um, 
at some point in my career, the Phillies decided that I would be a better anything than a baseball player. And so I had to try to figure out something to do. Uh, so to get a job was one possibility. And um, I did interview and get a job with, I don't even know if the company still exists, called Continental Can Company. Uh, in, I would be in New York for a year or two. I came back to Southwest Philly at that point. Uh, and as I'm getting ready to go to New York, I got a letter from the University of Wisconsin. I um, had forgotten that I had applied to one graduate school when I was at LaSalle, and it was at the instigation of a couple of my baseball teammates is, who might have seen the handwriting on the wall, what, what are you gonna do if you don't make baseball, uh, a baseball career? And my first reaction was, I don't know anybody at Wisconsin who's writing to me. Uh, that, true, I opened it up and it said, congratulations, you've been accepted at Wisconsin and awarded an assistantship. And I thought, hey, I've already got a job. I didn't throw it out, I just tossed it on a table. But every so often I'd pick it up. And I finally decided I'll go to Wisconsin and do that assistantship. Because I had a love of academics, no. I think it was because, to be brutally honest, I think, <laughs> uh, that I was, I feared going to New York on my own, trying to find a place to stay in that city. Uh, at that point in my life, I had never been out of Philadelphia or South Jersey, except for one stint in Oklahoma, a few weeks in Oklahoma. Uh, it was overwhelming to me, that idea. So going into a PhD program was an escape. <laughs> uh, always escaping, uh, escape artist. Uh, went to Wisconsin. I arrived at Wisconsin, I detested it. Uh, the professors were great, everybody, you know, the program is ex uh, exceptional program. I did not like the academic life. I, did, I met my fellow grad students, all of whom wanted to sit around and talk about theory this and theory why and whatever, and I wanted to talk about who won the Phillies game yesterday. And I thought, I have no connection with these people. This is not what I want to do. This is the biggest mistake I've ever made in my life, thinking I want to be a professor. I, I don't want to do this. If I had had the return fare, again, I wouldn't be at this table. I don't know where I'd be, but I would not be at this table. I didn't have the return fare. So it was, okay, I will work a couple months, get my TA, my teaching assistant check, save up enough money, I don't want to abandon people, I'll wait till the end of the semester, and I'm out of here. I had that all laid out, all planned out. Um, Somewhere during that semester, one of the professors came to me and said, we've heard some good things about your teaching, I guess you'd call it, with students in what they called at Wisconsin quiz sections, discussion sections. How would you like to teach your own class in the spring? You know, Professor so-and-so has gone off and said, well, it'll be principles of economics for non-economic majors. And I thought, hey, I can con non-economic majors, right, about whatever. Well, the non-economic majors turned out to be engineers. Yes, well, that was an interesting semester. But my recollection was $4,500 for me to teach that class was like, whoa. And so I stayed. And uh, stayed and finished the program. Uh, my first teaching job was at Holy Cross. I hadn't finished my dissertation yet. I don't think anybody gets hired anymore without finishing their dissertation, having finished their dissertation. But I had not, but I got hired and it was a wonderful place to be. Great school, but I started interviewing around about, because I wanted to do some research and writing as well. Holy Cross was a great teaching school. Um, there was a, staying with this theme of escape and, and uh, accident. There was a professor at uh, uh, MIT who knew a professor at Holy Cross who said, hey, send him over here. We have a guy here from Cornell named George Hildebrand. Uh, he's visiting and 
I'm sure he'd be happy to talk to him. I talked with George Hildebrand for an hour. I thought, man, this is, what a great guy, and this is wonderful. And he said something at the end, but no one leaves Cornell. There's just no turnover, but I'll take your resume and like, ah, oh, you know, I'll take your resume and keep it on file thing. Okay, and I'm driving back a little diminished, whatever. Two or three, I had to, in the meantime, pursued a job at Temple University. Uh, that's what I wanted at that point. I wanted to teach working class kids just like me. Uh, first generation, whatever. That's what I wanted to do. And I was 99% sure. Married then, had a couple. We had uh, three children. And uh, I get this letter from Morris Newfeld, some of the folks out there remember Morris, to uh, talk to George Hildebrand. We have an opening, would you be interested? Well, it turned out, I didn't know it at the time, but the opening was a position held by a professor named Jesse Carpenter. His wife in some previous months had died. He renewed an acquaintance with an old high school sweetheart. It's the story as I was told. They sparked, I guess, if that's the word, and decided to get married and leave. He would leave, retire, and leave Cornell and go back to South Carolina, where they were both from. That's what created the opening. Mm. That occurred between my talk with George Hildebrand. George Hildebrand said, come on. I went over and I interviewed, and I remember being on this campus for the first time. I was absolutely overwhelmed. I had no... And my thought in my head was, what am I doing here? Uh, mm -hmm. I don't mean making a rational calculation of what am I doing. It's what the blank am I doing here? And this is not, this is just too much. Uh, did the interview, <laughs> offered me a job. Flying home, flew to Boston. Called my wife. How did it go? Her, her mother was visiting at the time. How did it go? I said, well, they offered me a job. I couldn't say anything else. And she's hollering in the background to her mother, we're going to Cornell. We're going to Cornell. And I'm, but, 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 uh, I wanted to go to Temple. But anyway, we came to Cornell. So um, I still have, you know, this, the end of this bit of our presentation, I guess. I still have this combined feeling, talking 50 years now, huh, of inadequacy and awe about Cornell. Uh, I have it when I go to class. I, I think it's the explanation why I prepare so hard for class is a little bit of insecurity too. But sometimes I'm walking down the hallway to class and I actually stop. I don't know if I physically stop, but in my brain I stop and think, I'm not sure I can do this. Uh, I like to think it doesn't show when the class is going, but I, I don't think of myself as an academic, although I'm a professor of 50 years at Cornell University, but I still, like my old grad student connections at Wisconsin, don't like to sit around and talk about theories. I have a real concern that academics pulls people away from the streets, abstracts, theorizes about whatever, generalizes about, you start talking about workers rather than actually having known a worker or being in a working family. And I, I, it's something that really bothers me immensely. But but uh, you've been able to keep one foot in the real world through a lot of different things you do, such as the sports arbitration. And you bring that into the classroom. And, and you're out there actually mediating disputes. Um, I like to think, I mean, if we, if the question, when maybe I'm twisting the question a little bit is, so after 50 years, what do you think? <laughs> what do you think? Uh, I like to think that um, those who've had labor arbitration for me and other courses related, um, 
know that a good chunk of that is the sort of how to do it, technical skill, how to write an opinion, how to uh, make a good opening statement, whatever it might be. But I, I like to think that my major contribution has been the theme I hammer ever since I've been here, uh, is that um, um, we're talking about rights, we're talking about justice, we're talking about human beings, we're talking about their lives. And so if you're an arbitrator, you don't have all these skills we're talking about, but compassion, empathy, a sense of justice. And so, uh, yeah, I, if I've touched any students over the years or anyone else out there with writing or lecturing or whatever, uh, to inspire them to have that dimension, to make mm -hmm. lives better for other people, and it's a little cliche, but the world a better place, and labor, the work world a better place, uh, in the sense of justice and fairness, uh, th that would be um, touching, moving. It would make so much of it all worthwhile. Because I think, and it's probably true of anybody in any job, there are sometimes situations where I'll think, man, uh, does what I'm doing make any difference at all to anybody? Any book I read, make any difference to anybody, if any, or, or have written and make any difference, or any classes or courses or connection with students. I'm thrilled sometimes when I get a note from a former student saying those things that, yeah, it did make a difference or whatever, and that's, that makes it all worthwhile to me. On the arbitration front, um, the sports arbitration, in a way, it's not the real world. <laughs> uh, sitting in, 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 when I did baseball salary arbitration, uh, deciding whether somebody's going to get 14 million or 12 million it, is not the real world to me. Mm -hmm. uh, it probably serves some function. I do hockey now, which is the idea with disputes between uh, uh, players and their agents, which is we might want to talk about or someone out there might want to talk about. Uh, but for me, when I, and when I say that to students, now I've arbitrated for umpteen years, and I've had hundreds of arbitration cases, discipline cases involving reinstatement, for example, or people who have been discharged. Another, what strikes me in the connection, a great question about one foot in the real world, is with my concern about academics abstracting from the real world and losing touch with the real world, Arbitration's been one way to keep in touch with the real world. And so when I think of contributions that might have had with students and, uh, and, and, and might have affected their lives, I think, I hope in a positive way, and the lives of other people that deal with them, so many people have come before me who've lost their jobs and been fired. And so we have a hearing. I might, this might be the end of my arbitration career by saying this. But one of the great accomplishments I think of is when I think I'm correct and the evidence justifies it and whatever, that there was not just cause. I've been in a position to reinstate those folks to the jobs that they held, uh, put them back. And I'm thinking growing up as a kid, you know, unemployment <laughs> was a regular uh, activity in, in my house. And so it was possibility that somebody would come along and be able to put you back on the job to have that. Now, my, I know as an arbitrator, my job's not out there to just keep reinstating people. But when it's justified, that's an amazing, e even if it's two people or three people, but I, I think it's, no, my record in discipline and discharge cases, but many, many more than that. And I think that's a, to be able to be in that position to say that's an accomplishment, that's such only of my own doing, but it's part of being at Cornell and part of being a professor here is to have that opportunity to be an arbitrator mm -hmm. and to uh, do that kind of thing. We're getting some great questions in. Okay, then I'll shut up. And well, no, one of them is right down this alley, and it's, is it difficult to be neutral as an arbitrator when you believe in the human rights of all workers? It's an, that is an excellent question. Uh, and my answer to that is, 
Yes. Uh, there, there's a sense, I think, sometimes of um, an arbitrator approaching the case as a neutral. And uh, honestly, I, I don't believe there's any such thing uh, as, as neutrality. If you know about a subject, if you studied it, you have information on it, you have a point of view on it. Uh, I mentioned alcoholism before. Let's say I had a case involving somebody who's an alcoholic on the job. You know, my whole boyhood was influenced by that. And so, boy, do I have some opinions about that and the consequences of that? Yeah. Could I render a decision in that case involving that person, even if the evidence was an alcoholic? Absolutely. I think it would be a betrayal of the trust that people put in me to do otherwise. And if I felt that I feel so strongly about alcoholism that if anyone takes a drink, they're going to go to hell. And now this case involves somebody drinking on the job. I got to disqualify myself from that. But if it's, hey, I know all about alcoholism. I know the horrors it can cause. I know the pain it can cause the people suffering from uh, that disease, which I believe it is. Uh, hey, it just makes me better equipped to hear that. And human rights, boy, I hope there's nothing inconsistent between the promotion and protection of human rights and just cause for discharge. Uh, it, it does seem to me that they are consistent in the determination of whether it was just cause for discipline or whatever to absolutely have a standard of justice and fairness that respects the human rights of all human beings. I mean, otherwise, I think you ought to bag that process. If the arbitration process is just to aid and abet unions or employers or to facilitate production or whatever, then we ought to bag that one. Uh, that of unions, question is so wonderful yeah. that it would take an enormous amount. I probably yeah. haven't done there's a dozen Answer of them here. To it, they're, oh, okay. they're excellent. Your, your former away. students are, are coming up with some uh -oh. great stuff. It might not be good. <laughs> this one from Tom Duzak. I hope I Tom pronounced Duzak, that. Tom Duzak, my guy. How are you, Tom? <laughs> he writes, You're still in Pittsburgh. He writes, Jim, I came to the ILR school as a way to find work with a labor union. Because of what I learned from you, as well as Dave Lipsky, Gene McKelvey, and others, my dreams came true. That was 48 years ago. Today, what can the ILR school do to help similar students qualify for and find union side or related yeah. employment? Yeah, th this has been, it's a great question, Tommy. That's something that's been bothering me, a long, bothered me a long time. And I put some of the onus, well, let's see, how can I put this? Some of, uh, over, uh, Tom's question was really true even when Tom was here. Uh, but there had been a shift in the school, I think, and that collective bargaining, labor law, labor history, or whatever, is really not top dog anymore. Uh, we're still, I think, an important part of the school, but human resources and organizational behavior and some of the other activities, I think, are much more um, connected uh, with uh, industry, jobs, so on. Uh, Part of that, so part of what's Tom's question, I think, is the consequence of that shift, but it, to more to business-oriented stuff, I think. But secondly, I, I put some of the onus on labor uh, unions themselves, that not beating uh, the bushes here, uh, coming up looking for really outstanding students. We have a lot of really good students many of whom are still very interested in careers in the labor movement. But the, all, the question always, how do I go about that? How do I find that? Or sometimes the positions available, which I understand, and is a test, is organizing, going out and organizing in the hinterland somewhere for, for not very much money and a lot of risk and a lot of frustration. That's part of it and test of dedication and so on. There got to be better jobs out there in the labor movement, but to shake out of this notion that we ought to just promote from within and have our own folks come up to, to really utilize the ILR school and other schools like it for top-notch talent 
and a lot of so many, uh, uh, so many of our students not only have that capability and the, the uh, competence, but the dedication to do that. They're still there. Uh, sometimes they're on their own trying to find um, a job. In now we do have a union fair, we do have social justice fair. People come up and talk about jobs and stuff, and that's a big plus. But that ought to be multiplied by a hundred. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I'm sure I'm not answering Tom's question completely, but it's a great question. Well, here's another related one from Bob Kozma. What hope do you have for the future of the labor movement in the U.S.? Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, I, current trends going, not much hope. I think, for me, uh, one of the tragedies in the uh, history of the labor movement was what sometimes people would uh, blow celebratory horns about was the triumph of business unionism, uh, the bread and butter unionism, wages, hours, and working conditions. Uh, are wages, hours, and working conditions important? They surely are. One of the consequences, however, is a narrow focus on wages, hours, and working conditions for my group. So I'm, I'm the characterization of labor unions as self-interest groups, I think flows directly from that. I'm actually not only competing with my employer to get better uh, wages and so on, I'm competing with some other unions. Th this notion of labor solidarity, forget it. Everybody's pursuing their own self-interest. As long as that and I believe, unfortunately, it still characterizes so much of the labor movement. It's changing a bit too slowly, I think. Uh, but question about human rights and work I'm doing in human rights and so on is, I say to unions when I talk to them, don't talk about yourselves as just as interest groups and getting better wages, hours, and working conditions. That, that's important. You do that. But you are non-governmental human rights organizations. You are against discrimination. You want safety and health at the workplace. You want decent wages f and decent jobs for people out there. You, you, if you went down a catalog of human, you're for freedom of association. And if you went down that catalog, you're it. Present yourself that and connect up with other organizations out there doing the same kind of thing. Women's groups, civil rights groups, uh, community organizing groups. So, some of that's being done. It's, it's hard work, but that to me is the hope. Pursuing the hope that, you know, business unionism will, maybe we'll have another giant recession or depression or something, and then business union will triumph again. That, that's sad. Yeah. Yeah, Lowell Turner, uh, founding academic director of the Worker Institute. Lowell Red Turner. <laughs> yes, and he says, I remember Jim, you, Lowell. <laughs> let's turn this country around. Um, and he mentions the Worker Institute with its Union Leadership Institute, labor movement revitalization efforts. And I know that you worked uh, closely with the Worker Institute a couple of years ago when you put on an anniversary conference for the NLRA, yeah. correct? The, uh, thanks for the infomercial, Lowell. <laughs> uh, the, uh, no, it, Lowell's correct. One of the major activities in ILR, not only students, but faculty as well, is the Worker Institute. And so questions about where's the labor movement going, I think, in great part, find out what that operation's all about. We did that conference two years ago now, I guess. and. Uh, uh, it was very successful in New York, sponsored by the Worker Institute. One of the themes, and I think the, on, the, uh, on the question of future of the labor movement, that w really needs to be addressed, almost everybody in that room, in, when the discussion sections occurred with the panels, were workers of some sort or another, uh, from uh, lower paid, jo paid jobs, unskilled jobs, they're very highly skilled, highly positioned jobs, but they all said the same thing. You're talking, not only me, but almost all the panels, about exercise of freedom of association, exercising collective organization, all that good stuff. Yes, we agree, that's it. But 
In order to do that, we have to risk our job. There's something inherently, when we talk about the future, you know, what labor movement could do, whatever, something inherently wrong, fundamentally in violation of human rights. For people who want to exercise their freedom of association, to have to undertake the risk of losing their job in order to do that, to get fired or not promoted or punished in some other way. The fact that that, just in that conference, it was, if people went, you know, I'm in a high paying job, whatever, but I can't risk my job by doing this. I'm in a low paying job, I can't risk my job working fine. Across the board, why the blank do people have to risk their livelihoods in order to exercise what around the world, although it's not practiced around the world, but around the world is accepted as a fundamental core human right, exercise freedom of association. So I can say, go out, organize, have community groups and all that. Uh, easy for me to say, I have tenure. I, I am in the total, going back to my childhood now, I am in the total, totally unreal world of academe where I don't know what I'd have to do to get fired. Uh, and but other people, you, you look at a supervisor cross-eyed and you get fired. Or you even talk about a union and you get fired. There's something haywire about that. And uh, that needs to be addressed seriously by labor movement itself and all other kinds of groups. Uh, and obviously very meaningful because the accolades are pouring in. Um, Mike you're says, just pretending, no, right? I'm not. I can't see what There's you're so reading many from, but you're just making in, this you're up. Gonna have to you're just making this take up. Take care of this after right. the webcast because we can't possibly get all of these in. But Mike, um, no last name, writes in working in a non union factory, starving for connections to my old labor roots. This conversation is meaningful to me, um, which is great. Um, thanks for writing in, Mike. Um, just a couple Thank of more you, questions and we'll wrap it up, but um, another viewer wrote in, in view of the current attack on collective bargaining rights, is there a role that arbitrators can play? Um, <laughs> that's a very good question. Uh, almost everything I've written about labor arbitration has been critical of it. Uh, too much of labor arbitration in my mind. There are exceptions. I am going to get to that answer, I think. Uh, too much of it is uh, commercialization. Too much is, of it is careerism. Too much of it is simply a, trying to treat employers and unions as one's clients uh, to get reinvited to the cases. Uh, I've, I've been at, um, a member of the National Academy of Arbitrators, and they actually used to use the term, I believe, client for labor management, uh, for union and management representatives. Uh, that sense of, of arbitration as dealing with clients and a big money-making scheme uh, is repulsive to me. And I think it's, the answer to that question is, I would have no faith in arbitrators of that sort who are in business to make a buck. Now, I can say that in part, I guess, I mean, I believe that, but I would say it anyway. But I can say it because I have tenure. I'm a labor arbitrator, and that earlier question is, hey, if I'm doing human rights stuff out there and people say, hey, this guy's biased or whatever, we're not going to pick him anymore, I'd still have a life, right? I'd still have a decent income. Don't let the dean hear that. <laughs> a decent income uh, from teaching if I never had another arbitration case. My nose would be out of joint. I don't look to arbitrators to make social change, to bring about social justice. I do look for the people that appear before arbitrators to do that. And one way is to get, if arbitrators are gonna focus on contracts, get this stuff in your contract. Instead of having just a management rights clause, having a human rights clause in your collective bargaining agreement as well. So the arbitrator has to deal with that. Make these arguments, human rights arguments you'd like, before your arbitrators so that the arbitrator, it's on the record, and the arbitrator can ignore that. Uh, but I'm saying that again at a time when organized labor is diminishing, fewer and fewer collective bargaining agreements out there. So, but that's, that's a way uh, 
to do it. Um, another, I guess, is partly what I see as kind of, of preaching, I guess, the human rights doctrine out there that worker rights are human rights and through worker institutes and other groups, community organizations, whatever, to push this. At that conference you mentioned, there was a wonderful woman, Hetty Rosenstein, who's a, a CWA, uh, a regional director, I believe, uh, in sort of frustration, shouted out from her panel, why are people not in the streets? Why is everybody putting up with this? And then she went through the catalog of stuff uh, that's going on and with impunity, it seems. Now, people are beginning to get in the streets and for sometimes for, for different reasons. I find that encouraging. When I was on a Fulbright at uh, McGill some years ago, and it was a wonderful experience for me in many, in many ways, but one was every afternoon, almost like clockwork, there'd be a demonstration. I'd run over to my office window, look out <laughs> on Sherbrooke, which was one of the main thoroughfares, and there'd be five, six, seven blocks worth of people marching up, chanting about something. I have no idea, mostly, what the chants were about and what the demonstrate, but they were in the streets. And, the, and the, the, the police and whatever were facilitating them doing their march, not trying to inhibit them or discourage them. Uh, that to me was so wonderful that people cared enough every day, every day to be out there in the streets. Uh, and I know that's not a really coherent answer to all that, but it's uh, difficult to come up with a, because things are in such, I think, such bad shape. Not hopeless, but bad shape. Nicole Smart, MPS 15, writes in, you have certainly served as an inspiration to many during your 50 years as an ILR faculty member. What are your thoughts on diversity and inclusion in the labor movement? I think uh, diversity and inclusion, oh, okay. Uh, let me go back partly to my arbitration question and then I, I want to broaden out on this. Almost all labor arbitrators still look like me. They're white. I don't have my tie on today and I have my arbitration suit on today. But they look just like me. Most of the advocates who appear before me, lawyers or otherwise, also look like me. There have been some breakthrough in that there are more women than before acting as advocates but more and more and more people who appear before me as grievance, people who lost their job, people who didn't get the promotion, whatever it is, don't look like me or the people who represent them. Different colors, different ethnic backgrounds, different languages. And so when I said to my students in arbitration, okay, you gotta have empathy and compassion or whatever, ah, not so easy to talk about empathy if I don't know anything about that person's culture or background or history or whatever. It's a serious problem, I think, in labor arbitration. A serious problem beyond it if the people who are still representing unions are uh, still white males, that's not a good idea either because they must have the same problem I have as an arbitrator, relating, connecting to the people that they're representing. The people that are part of the labor movement are what I like to call the people. <laughs> uh, huh? uh, they're the real people in the world, the uh, day laborers and, uh, and so on. Uh, people that I grew up with in my neighborhood, uh, those are suffering, fighting, working, drinking, <laughs> whatever, but uh, trying to survive. Those are the people who desperately need help, but those people, are as diverse as they can possibly be in terms of ethnic background, gender, the works. They are not at this point being represented the way they ought to be represented, not just by organizations interested in representing them, but by, the, by themselves. I mean, one of my big complaints, it's not gonna solve that problem in arbitration is that uh, no, no disrespect for lawyers out there. there. There are some great lawyers out there. But the, uh, you don't need a lawyer in all these cases. And many of the um, 
union cases in particular, I think, could be presented maybe even more effectively by people who are at the workplace, the shop stewards, the business, the, the uh, union president or whatever, uh, who know uh, the consequences of the, or influence of the diversity at the workplace. I think overall, labor movement's made some progress, but has a long way to go on the diversity front. Um, but also, if, if we talk about inclusion in the sense of freedom of association doesn't mean just labor, just labor unions, but means all other kinds of organizations so that we have one freedom of association exercise with many groups coalescing and coming together. That to me is the great possibility for diversion, uh, diversity. In my class, you can't live without diversity. I mean, the idea that you know some students get a nose out of joint about affirmative action or whatever. Oh, so I had a friend who got an SAT score that was 100 points more than you know somebody who was an African American. They got it. And that's not fair. It's reverse discrimination. You know, it's just too too horrible to even. It's too horrible to even repeat. If I have a classroom of everybody who came from the same place, it's a boring classroom. If I have a classroom, some of the classes I teach depend on people coming from all around the world. And, and again, you're talking from a kid who, <laughs> uh, for a long time, uh, didn't get out of the neighborhood. And so I, I really appreciate how important that is. You talk about narrow blinders, all I knew was what I grew up with, and gradually over the years, in great part, thanks to Cornell, uh, it, it, I've had exposure to things that people take for granted. One of the first dinners I ever attended here, I mean a social dinner with faculty members, who were extremely nice to me, by the way, people were talking about, oh, their time in Greece, or were, when you're in uh, uh, you know, Thailand, you have to go to this place, you have to go, and I'm sitting here like, yeah, I've, I've heard about those places, you know. <laughs> I mean, I know where those countries are, I think, but uh, it, that's part of being overwhelming. But that's part of learning, right? I mean, it's a learning experience for me, but students have to learn from each other as well as maybe learn something from me, uh, but they have to learn from each other. And I learn from the students, sounds hokey, but that's gonna be increased the more uh, diverse experiences, ethnic and cultural backgrounds that are out there. It's vital to learning. It's not just a nice thing. It's not just something to comply with the law. It's an inherently necessary to have a real learning experience, I think. Okay. Um, Ed Potter writes in, Hi Jim, my wife and I recently downsized in Atlanta. One thing that survives survived for your books, and I know you've written seven, on arbitration and values, the National Labor Relations Board, and on worker rights and human rights. How do you view respect for human rights being implemented in companies today? Uh, well, first of all, I finally discovered who's actually read those books. <laughs> so you're the one or the one, so thank you. Um, I actually, um, some progress. Uh, I'm a big critic of uh, corporate social responsibility plans. Uh, I'm going to modify, mainly because they're not monitored very carefully. Often they're just public relations jobs. Uh, the um, and, and so I think to some extent they're diversions or camouflage. Uh, not doing justice to all. But we just had uh, in my uh, workplace safety and health class as a human right, we had a, um, a man, Michael Bride, who um, is the training director of the Bangladesh Accords. You may remember the Rana Plaza building collapses and the fires mm -hmm. and whatever. And uh, again, somewhat different view, a more optimistic view of what could be done with these programs. Uh, many American companies, not well, some American companies, mainly European countries, uh, companies contributing to this fund, paying for building renovations, actually paying, 
not just running scared about lawsuits and liability, or whatever, but actually upfront paying for this, having serious monitoring arrangement. I mean, that's real possibility. If I back up, sometimes I think around and, and I talk freedom of association and labor unions and community groups and whatever worker institutes, uh, particularly ours, but the potential for good, such as I'm defining good, that rests with employers is immense. I mean, as people out there know, there are employers that uh, have uh, budgets uh, bigger than many countries in the world, right? And so, uh, not only good in their own operations, but if they came together, I don't mean paternalism, I mean encouraging bottom-up organization. I mean, one of the things I, for example, the real test for, to me, of, <laughs> maybe a little late and get on uh, dangerous ground here, but of a uh, corporate social responsibility plan and or a human resources department is its attitude toward the exercise of freedom of association and its protection and promotion of that freedom of association and willing to deal with the people who do organize on an independent, truly independent basis that they have organized from the bottom up with respect for their rights. Otherwise, I think it uh, can be, often is, a uh, camouflage, a fake out, and a manipulative device to get employees to do what the company wants them to do without changing the power relationship between the company and the employee. I don't know if they, I'm an, an overwhelming number of employees, except in the unreal faculty world at Cornell, are employees at will. I mean, you can be fired for any reason or no reason whatsoever, as long as it doesn't violate what's called, I think, unfortunately, external law. But if I'm led to believe this is a wonderful place to work, and the people I work for care about me, and I'm integral to the operation. I can believe that, but it doesn't change the fact that at a snap of a finger I can get fired for no good reason whatsoever. And I can't talk about arbitration, agreements, procedure, because there ain't none. And so that's, that to me is a fundamental violation of human rights. That employment at will is a fundamental violation of human rights. It makes, renders people powerless. It renders them uh, vulnerable to manipulation. It means they're ri that, that fear we talked about earlier about a risk, I gotta take a risk if I talk freedom of association and unionization to my job. All the bad stuff, I think, flows from that powerless position. And if this school, in, in the uniqueness of this school, it seems to me, over the years is that it taught collective action. And it had all the other personnel and human resources, whatever, but the core of the school was collective action, organization, collective bargaining, and empowerment, not just by somebody granting you stuff, but you get power to influence the decisions that affect your life. That's what I grew up with. What I grew up with is nobody I grew up had any power to influence their own lives. And thanks to you, Professor Gross, thousands of students have left here knowing how to empower other people. And they've, a lot of them have written in today, and I'm, I'm excited for you to see what they've written. We don't have time. We're running out. It's almost an hour. But I'm going to leave with one comment from uh, Brendan Keating, uh, who's a graduate, 1915 graduate of the MPS New York City program. I and do he remember writes, Brendan well. <laughs> I'm a shop steward now in the AFT working at Rutgers University. You, Professor Gross, helped me get up the courage to follow the dream instead of the money. So thanks, everyone, for joining us Can it make me today. cry, Brendan? Thank <laughs> you. Uh, Thank you. Cornell University.